I think we're live, I'm not sure. Um, telling me the stream does not look good. Bear with me. For those of you who have just tuned in, obviously this is a live stream. Um, trying to make sure that it's going to be worth moving forward, that the audio and video is at least understandable. Um, I have all my stuff muted and I'm going to try to minimize any and all distractions, uh, but I will keep the chat window in the corner here. Um, if you saw in one of the places I posted, I put a link on LinkedIn and Facebook and uh, in the XYO Geohackers um, Discord group as well as on Reddit. So th I have promoted this a little bit with no notice because I'm a nobody and nobody should be watching for me to do this. But um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. If you can hear me and see me, I guess we're good. So um, first off, I'm Nick, uh, Nick Watier, Nick Sintowski. Long story I won't go into today, uh, but I've been following XYO for about a year now, um, which to some may think that's a long time to be watching XYO and their development. Some may think it's a very short time. Um, I have a background in computer science. I went to uh, to technical college for a program called Microcomputer Specialist, where uh, we kind of had a, a good overview of everything you could do on a microcomputer. And, and by microcomputer, I basically mean a Windows uh, PC. So there was elements of networking, elements of programming, um, elements of hardware, like building and finding the right pieces to put together. Uh, you know, that's a good, what, 15, 10, 15 years ago now. So some of that information is a bit dated, but I'm very interested and I stay in touch with the market. Um, I also happen to work at an IT VAR where we sell to bigger businesses. My position now is actually in live event production and broadcasting. So I'm, I'm not what I'm trying to get to. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not an employee or an agent of XYO. I'm just somebody who heard what they were doing, said, huh, that sounds kind of interesting. I want to learn more and, and did a little bit of legwork. Uh, there is a lot of information out there about XYO. Um, and for somebody new that wants to know what they're talking about, it's a lot to ingest at once. So that's kind of why I'm making this video here. Um, we see in the Reddit forums and we see in the Discord group, uh, people pop in all the time with questions and and it, it, it's obvious that they haven't read the white paper or the yellow paper or um, they've never heard of a bound witness transaction or we have a lot of people that will say, hey, I just bought a mining kit. When do I get money? It's going to take some time, right? So this video is going to go through a quick overview. I'm not going to go into the techie details. I mean, I could start talking about the cryptography behind a bound witness and what a SHA hash is and all that stuff. I'm not going to that level. Um, I don't know that I'm the right person to ever do that, to be honest. But I'm going to talk about what technologies are used, why they matter, and then hopefully this video can be used as a resource going forward um, to help the new people learn what they're trying to do. Now, um, just for the record, I feel like I should also say um, there will be some opinion, some forward-looking statements, and again, as not an official representative of XY Company, um, I might be wrong. Um, these are my learnings and my understandings. Uh, there may be inaccuracies, uh, but I'm going to teach to the best of my ability with no intent to deceive or uh, misinform. Uh, also want to state, because you know how things are on the internet, I am recording this on a YouTube live stream on April 24th of 2019 at 5.50 p.m. Central Time. Uh, so, what is XYO as a brief overview? Um, a lot of people have gotten interested because they've heard of the mining kit, and they heard of the ability to make money, and and they're talking about, um, you know, uh, using the coin app to collect um, XYO and, and, and geo mine, uh, geo drop or collect geo drops. Um, there's a lot of words out there that don't mean much to people until you, you really kind of dig in and see what it all is. So at the very basic, at the very start, XYO 
is about location data. Now, let's go... There's competitors out there. Um, Tile, TrackR, Pixie, um, and, and even XY Find It was kind of their first incarnation. The idea is you take your, your car keys or your laptop bag or something valuable to you, and you put a tracking device on it, and this tracking device um, will Bluetooth connect to your phone, and you can do a couple things with that. And, and it, each company does it a little bit differently, but in general, um, your token and your phone will um, stay in touch, and should you one day lose your token and whatever it's attached to that's valuable to you, you can go to your phone and see the last known location. Now that obviously um, is built on the idea that your phone has a GPS and it knows the presence of the token and it stores where it is, uh, updates every five minutes or whatever you have it set to. Uh, and then when you leave, well, hey, I don't see it anymore, so it must still be at that last known good location. Which is cool. Um, years ago, my wife would lose her keys in the house all the time, and it's not a it's not a huge house. I mean, you're looking at uh, close to half of it right now. Um, she would lose her keys around the house, so she could get one of these little things. And as long as she didn't lose her phone and her keys, she's okay. Because on the device, you can double tap, and it'll find your phone. Your phone will ring. You can go get it. Great. Um, or if you're on your phone, you can push the button and this thing will beep. You know, you kind of heard it there. Um, this will beep in different patterns to indicate how it's been interacted with. Um, so these are nice devices. The problem is, what if um, I have a meeting and a friend's picking me up on the way to work and I don't bring my keys because, yeah, who cares, no big deal, and I forgot my phone or I couldn't find my phone. Well, now two devices are missing, and until I find one of those two, I can't locate the other. Now, yeah, there's there's workarounds, you know, with Tile, and, and I think even with XY Find It, you could go to a browser and find the last known location for those devices. But in general, you couldn't use the one finds the other technology. But the other thing is, what if during that time where both devices are lost, uh, something gets moved. What if I lose my key in a taxi cab? What if I uh, leave my phone on my desk at work and the cleaning crew moves it uh, to the neighbor's cube while they're working on my desk or something like that? Uh, well, there would be no backup plan in a XY Find It tile uh, phase. And I'm going to stop talking about track on and Pixie because I, I really don't know much about them. XYO Network aims to fix that but it's at a whole different scale. And I think that's part of what people are missing. Um, right now, XYO is in an awkward phase. If you followed me at all on, on Reddit, my account is what's your ENT. Um, if you followed me there, I've been very critical of the XY company. Um, and, and it's not that I don't like them. It's not that I'm upset about anything. It's that I would like to help them be better and help them be more transparent. Right now, a lot of their advertising is about the sizzle, about the, ooh, you can make money, or ooh, you can find anything, or ooh, this is the next big thing. Man, am I tired of that ad, the next big thing. It doesn't tell us anything, right? Tell people what they're getting invested in. And I understand, it's marketing, it, it's how you get people interested in something they know nothing about. That's the way they're choosing to go. I disagree with it, but hopefully it works for them, because right now, um, we're in a bit of a chicken and egg problem with XY Network, especially for people asking when they're going to see a return on their mining kit. Um, to cut the long story short, what is going to happen when we talk about geome mining? Data gets collected between the devices, and I'm going to talk about that more, but data gets collected between the devices, and that data may be useful to somebody. So, hey... I lost my keys. I want to know where they are. Well, I decide that it's worth 50 bucks to find my keys. That's a little ridiculous because I could have a key recut for that. But let's say that's what's going to happen. I want to find my keys, and here's $50 to do it. Um, 
so you go out to the XY. Um, well, right now they have the the XYO Matrix app, which has kind of a mock-up of how that's going to work. I don't know if that's the finalized implementation yet. But you'd go to that website. You'd enter the ID of what you've lost. So you have to know what this is. Uh, you enter the ID of the device, and you enter your stake of how much you are willing to pay to find this. And then all the data that's been collected from all of the XY-enabled devices in the network gets combined and searched to find your device. And any data that was useful is going to earn part of that $50 stake that you've put out there. So um, let's, let's pause there for now. And we'll come back to this after I describe a little bit more. But that's the idea, is say I have eight of these. I'm just using the number eight because that's what comes in the geomining kit, right? I put one of my keys. I put one of my wife's keys. I put one on my non-existent dog's collar. I put one in my backpack for my laptop, one in my wife's. I put one in my house permanently that never leaves. Give one to mom. Whatever I do, I have eight of them, right? Well, as they see each other, they create what's called a bound witness, which I'm going to describe later. And those bound witness interactions, um, storing them, sending them, processing them, all of those actions of creating, storing, transferring, all of those actions around a bound witness earn you a stake of what somebody is willing to pay for as useful location data. And that's what the word geomining really means. It's earning your stake of somebody's proposed value. Now, this is just one example, finding lost objects. Another example that they like to use is um, delivery verifications. So let's say you're going to order a product from an online company, and they are going to offer free shipping, and they aren't going to bill you until it's delivered. Right. Amazon Home Delivery is working on right now the ability to enter the front door and put the package inside. So they could literally charge you when the package is in your house. Well, the XYO network enables the capability of automating that bill process, and it's your device verifying it, not trusting the shipper that they've scanned the package correctly and delivered it to the right house. So it's a trustless system that will work and... Uh, the possibilities are endless, right? What XY is building is a framework for all these things to happen. Uh, and then we're waiting for, app, for for DAP developers, distributed app developers, to come up with the actual use cases and to find customers to use this network. Short answer for anybody asking the question, when am I going to make money off geomining? Short answer, when people think you're worth paying for doing the geomining. That's why I call it a chicken and egg problem right now. Because, for example, in my hometown of Green Bay, if I go into the XYO matrix and I take a look at the map, even though I know on my own devices I have over 600 bound witness transactions, and I know a good 400 or so of them have been uploaded to the, the primary archivist, which we'll talk about more, um... The map doesn't show any activity in my area. I don't know why that is at this point, but I know that my data isn't being used by anyone and therefore isn't worth anything to anyone. So we'll come back to this concept later, but I'm, I hope you're following and understanding that process. Geomining, it's not like Bitcoin where we're just creating Bitcoin that you now earn because you've been geomining. That's not the case. It's earning something that somebody else wants to pay. Okay, let's we'll move down <laughs> on, the, on the, uh, the chart here for what I plan on talking about. And if you have questions, feel free to put them in chat. Um, as I transition between topics, I will try and um, keep up with some of that chat. Uh, so what makes XYO different from these other apps? Well, first off, like I said, it's distributed. All of the devices participating that could possibly be found are also helping find each other. Um, the Tile app had something like this, but really only the phones 
we're doing it. Like in Tile, if I lose my keys, I can say, hey, Tile, I lost my keys. Help me find it. And then if any other phone happens to come across my keys, great. It's going to send me a notification that we found it. But if two sets of keys come in contact with each other, that that data doesn't do anything. It, it's not helping the network. Whereas in XY, each one of these can help everything else in the network. Okay. Um, the other nice thing, it's anonymous. It's built on a blockchain technology. This can get kind of nerdy and kind of deep. Um, if you are interested, I highly recommend checking out the yellow paper and the white paper. They're both great documents. Uh, I heard there was an announcement today. I think there's an orange paper. Have not read that. Have not seen it yet. Um, but those, those papers describe in very nerdy context, very, very techy, um, how you can trust bound witness transactions and, and how the anonymity is preserved. Uh, you don't need to know anything about the person you're interacting with other than their name, essentially. Um, and then, like I said, every device is important. Now, this I keep referring to as a Sentinel. Technically speaking, I purchased a XY4 Plus. That's what this Sentinel device is. In the long run, there will be other devices that will be referred to as Sentinel. Something that's been talked about a lot is the ability to print a sticker or like a shipping label that would be XY enabled. Technically speaking, it's totally legit, totally possible. Um, you can print RFIDs. I just don't know if it's going to be a cost-effective solution long run. I'm hoping it will be. The more that use it, the more cost-effective it'll become. Um, but you can build, like, the technologies out there right now where you can build either, like, a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino Uno uh, Sentinel or, like, the iPhone and iOS apps, or, sorry, the iOS and Android apps can operate as Sentinels. So um, don't necessarily get hum hung up on this as a Sentinel. This is just my example for right now. Um, a Sentinel is a device that interacts with other Sentinels and then bridges. So the bridge, the next step, is it takes all that data that's been collected and created throughout the day, and it collects it, verifies it, and sends it up to the archivists. Um, archivists are essentially large storage pools. I believe we're still built on top of, um, uh, what's it called, GFS? Uh, now my name escapes me. It's a, it, it's another uh, blockchain app, but it's basically distributed storage online. It, it's an open file-based system where uh, you know just ridiculous amounts of online storage are available, and their miners get compensated based on the amount of storage and the speed of access. It's an amazing thing. I think it's the universal file system, if I remember correctly. Uh, you can check me on that. But anyways... We've got Sentinels, Bridges, Archivists, right? So Archivists store Bridges, get it from the Sentinels to the Archivists. And then finally, the last layer in the chain is the Diviner. Now, the Diviner's purpose is to field questions. We, we hear somebody wants to know where tracking number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is. They tell a Diviner that one, two, three, four, five needs to be found. And then the diviner starts calling up archivists and say, hey, what do you know about package one, two, three, four, five? So archivists start shoving data at the diviners and the diviners start saying, well, this is really old and, and this is an unreliable source. And finally the diviner comes up with an answer. And in, in this process, the way I understand it, in this process, that stake that's been placed to find the answer uh, is getting distributed by the diviners to everything in the chain. So when it requests information from the archivists, it's paying the archivists a little bit of money. And, well, not money, XYO token. That's why they call it the oil of the future. The thing that makes the system work is the XYO token. So you're not going to say, here's 50 bucks. You're going to say, here's 50 bucks worth of XYO token. And then the diviner is going to keep a little bit of that off the top just like you know best buy selling iphones they get to keep 50 bucks off of every iphone that they sell and the rest of the money goes to apple right well in this case we're four tiers deep think about that for a second too if you're asking about your geo mining returns the diviner gets the money first takes a margin they pass some of that on to the archivists who takes a margin 
They pass some of that down to the bridges, who takes a margin. They pass some of that down to the sentinels. Okay, so it's a, it's the downward flowing system in terms of the wealth of geo mining, and it all starts with a request from somebody to use information. Okay, um, so let's talk for a little bit about the Coin app. I think this phone is still on. I had I had turned my devices off so that they wouldn't keep functioning while we were um, while we were chatting. So this is the Coin app on my spare phone. It's actually an old phone um, that I borrowed from somebody, and I actually just collected. I I wish I I hadn't. I would have waited a little bit. But the the Coin app gives you a nice neat map of your area. You can see the dark blue tile because I've just mined that area. Um, I actually really don't like that. Uh, I don't like that we're using the word mine. And it, it's a very important distinction. They, they put a pickaxe here. Um, let's go to the basics first off. A lot of questions that we get regarding the coin app. Yes, anybody can use coin. You don't need to spend anything. You just go to your device's app store, download coin. You're up and running. If you don't already own a Sentinel device, um, and I think this is specifically an XY4 Plus token. I don't know if it'll work if you build your own Sentinel. Have not tested that. Um, but if you have a Sentinel and you have the app, you're going to earn a lot more. Now, this phone, I just keep plugged in in my kitchen with a spare Sentinel sitting on top of it all day, every day, 24-7, plugged into wall power. And right now I'm at 28,589.8. XYO token. You probably can't read it because the camera probably can't focus that close. Um, and it's just going to sit there. I have auto collect turned on. Um, I have noticed it seems to run slightly slower if you're driving in a car with auto collect turned on. Um, and, and when I say driving in a car, I mean in the passenger seat while somebody else drives. Do not sit here and click the button while you're driving. It's not safe. I don't want you to get hurt. XY doesn't want you to get hurt. Be smart. Um, but I refuse, unless I make a mistake, I refuse to call this geomining. This is the important part I'm getting to. The XYO token geomining process and the coin app currently have nothing to do with each other. Nothing at all. You, you, you need a device of some sort and a device of some sort in the future, not currently, but in the future, it is entirely possible that XY Network could turn the coin app into a bridge, in which case this would be uh, potentially geomining. Right now, the coin app is collecting geo drops, and it's actually designed to enable other geo drops in the future. Um, what I mean by GeoDrop is uh, when we go back to the very beginning uh, of how cryptocurrencies work, uh, there's a couple different ways to do it. Like I said, in, in Bitcoin, uh, which is by far the most popular cryptocurrency, in Bitcoin, there is a maximum number of coins that ever can exist, and miners are discovering them and earning them through the process of mining. That's not how XYO works. In the XYO world, all of the coins that ever could be made were. XYO then opened up an ICO, or an initial coin offering, where they were selling coins at what should, in the long run, appear to be a very steep discount from the actual value of that coin to get them out there. And when you see the hodlers or the holders, those are the people that bought coin and are sitting on them, waiting for them to appreciate in value, or waiting for the network to become mature enough to use it for their purposes. There, there are a lot of businesses that bought in. I, I think, you know, there's some Fortune 500 companies that are just sitting on XYO token, waiting for the day when the network is robust enough for them to rely on it for tracking data. Um now, we, we boil that down and condense it, and what we're getting to is this extra coin. So, I don't remember the exact numbers, but when XYO sold their token, for every token they sold, they had a reservation of what they kept for themselves. We'll sell you this much, 
and I'm making up a number now, we'll sell you 10 tokens for a dollar, and then we get to create one for ourselves. So all the tokens were created up front. They went through the ICO of selling chunks of token to customers, and then putting some in a pool for themselves to keep. And then we've been told any tokens that were not sold or designated to them as part of the sale have been burned. And essentially the way you burn cryptocurrency token is to send it to a wallet and then destroy the public and private key. It would be nearly impossible to ever resurrect those tokens from the dead, assuming quantum computing doesn't try to take it on. I have no idea what quantum computing is going to do to the crypto world. It terrifies me a little, to be quite honest. So, anyways, um, we are talking coin. Geodrop, Geomine. The Geodrop, the coins you're collecting, the tokens you're collecting in the coin app are gifts from the XY company's private staff. Okay. Now, getting to my opinion space on this, it's fine that they're giving them out. We need to have people that have token. We need to have buzz. We need to have people holding, you know, my 25,000-ish that I have right now. I haven't bought any. That's all earned from using their apps and supporting their network and being a beta tester. It's what they're willing to pay me for the data I'm giving them and for, you know, being that, that test phase. But it's, in my opinion and my expectation, it's not a sustainable way of growing. They're not going to be able to give away their token forever. There will come a day where it's not going to be a, uh, possible. Unless, unless XYO plans to continue to own their own archivists, diviners, sentinels, and bridges in the network where they're earning income back. And then, yeah, if they want to give it out through coin, great. Uh, but at some point, if they keep giving away, they're going to run out. And, uh, you know, when we start talking about things like governance, they got to have some token that they're holding too, or they don't have a say in how their own system works. So that's where their reserve comes in. And the more they give away, the less power they're going to have in governance. And that's a bigger topic for another moment. Let's move on um, from the coin app to... The Sentinels again, and I'm going to get a little bit deeper here. Uh, are you guys following along? I, I know we have a couple viewers out there. Am I going too fast? Do you have any questions? Is the audio and video crap? Should I keep going? Should I stop? Give me anything. I'm going to take a quick sip here. All right. So, I own two of these. The first question that I have from everybody... The XY 4 Plus. Is this the same thing you get if you order a mining kit that comes with the Ocho box, which is eight XY 4 Plus Sentinels? And it's very confusing because if you go to XY Find It and you try to buy one of these, there's a big warning on the screen that says, hey, um, these aren't the same things you get with your mining kit. Well, as far as I can tell, they are the exact same physical piece of hardware. And there are other people that have said the same thing. Um, that being said, I don't own a mining kit. I haven't personally seen a mining kit other than other YouTube videos and pictures and whatever else. The physical hardware device is the same. The difference is the XY4 series of firmware, and there were a lot of steps in the Series 4 firmware, um, basically the software that runs inside of this doohickey, uh, it does not create bound witnesses. It does not do bound witness transactions. And if it doesn't do bound witness, what does that mean? It doesn't create mineable data. Okay, There's nothing to mine on an XY4 plus Sentinel. That being said... Once you have the app, <coughs> excuse me, once you have the app, and in my experience, the iOS app, Android app, for me at least, is not working. I use Samsung devices. Maybe it's specific. Maybe it's a rollout. I heard from XY today that they're planning a rollout soon. So um, Android users, hang on a couple weeks. I guess they're going to take care of you. Um, but I borrowed my iPad from work. 
And this actually told me, once you run this update, you are not a XY4 plus anymore, you are a Sentinel X. And it still has the four on the back, right? It's it's physically uh, XY4 plus, but it becomes in software a Sentinel X, which then means you can do bound witness transactions. Let's take a look inside one of these. I have my second one already opened up. Let me just uh, mock up here what it looks like. So you, you get your XY4 plus, and there's a little notch there where I just stuck my key and twisted, and this top pops right off. Sorry, kind of mirror mode here. So the top pops off, and this is just a piece of plastic. This lid is nothing special at all. It's a piece of plastic with some ridges cut in. I still haven't quite figured out how the button works because I can't feel it move when I do it, but it, it's just, it's snug. Really well engineered. Super tight construction. I would have no concern about water damage on these things. Um, and and yeah, it, it, it's really well built. Impressive to me. The, the plastic is thick. Like I can put some real pressure on this thing and I haven't done any damage or felt any flex. So right above that lid... We have the battery. Now, this is a massive, massive battery. As you can see, it takes up pretty much the whole device. This is a CR3032H, and they are pricey from what I've heard. I, I haven't done my own shopping yet, but the last I heard, I think they're around $10 a battery. And if you're a watch person, you're probably familiar with like the 3032 or, or camera people. It's the same thing, but it, this is like a 50 cent piece almost, or a, or a, a golden dollar, the Sacagawea dollar, much, much bigger than a quarter. And this is the bottom, what's underneath that battery. And what's crazy is I, I cracked this open because, like I said, I'm a nerd. I have some hardware experience. I wanted to open this up and play with it. You know, maybe I'd ruin one soldering it or something, see if I could find a way to plug into it and read the raw data. There's nothing in there. And I hope I'm not leaking any security letting you see that QR code. Uh, I think that's just my MAC address, which would be useless. I think it's a serial number. But on the board, it, uh, there's the S1 button, which is the only button. Uh, it says STM5, which is some marking on the mainboard manufacturer. And there's battery receiving points. And everything else is, I believe, a single chip on the bottom of the silicon. Uh, I've tried to get in here and lift the chip out to look underneath. Uh, that was a lost cause. I, I'm pretty sure it's glued and pressure locked in there. Um, but when you want to talk about the brilliance of the design of this piece, when you lay the battery in... Um, you can kind of push and you can try to activate it, but it doesn't seem to work right away. When you put the lid on, it almost instantly uh, wakes up. So I'll line it up, snap it around, and it's on. Um, so this is active right now. Um, and it, I can't prove this to you yet, but I know it already created a bound witness with this. It doesn't give me any indication that a bound witness has happened. It just happens. I don't know how frequently it happens. Um, my assumption is every, every five minutes, maybe they verify that they're together. What I do know from experience, it appears to be anytime they get within Bluetooth range of each other, they know that they've met, they create a bound witness transaction, and they kind of forget about each other for a while until something else happens. Um, it would be nice to know how frequently they will update, or if that is a thing. Like, will they update when they leave each other's presence? I don't see the data to, to confirm that or to deny that, but it's very interesting that without any sound, any picture, um, and I'll, I'll have something to show you later that I think is going to prove. I'm, I'm guessing we're going to have like a large packet of eight or 10 or 20 um, bound witness transactions move over to our bridge once I launch up the bridge app. So you can push the buttons. That wakes them up. Um, I'm assuming that by pushing those buttons, 
I've kind of forced it to bound witness with whatever's nearby, but I really don't know. It's a little bit of a mystery right now. Um, so that's it. That's a sentinel. And they're, they're tiny, right? I mean, I have, I have rather large hands. Um, what else can I compare it to? Well, an iPad, right? It's sizable or, you know, my, my, uh, galaxy, uh, S four. I think this one is, it's an old phone. Um, so they're sizable, but they've got a nice loudspeaker. They've and, and they've got some memory. Obviously, I don't know how much. That's kind of what I was interested in. How many bound witnesses can this store? If I don't see a bridge for a month, is that going to be okay? Is my data even worth it anymore? Anyways, we've seen inside the four plus. It is the same hardware, as far as I can tell, as the stuff that ships with the mining kit. The mining kit just comes with a way to update the firmware, and you don't have to jump through the hoops of getting apps and manually doing the updating process. Once you get your official bridge with your memory card, you know, they have the new memory card update. Once you have your new bridge with your new memory card, and you have your Sentinel's presence, they just boom, and they work, and it's great, and it's fantastic, and if you're not a tech nerd, and you don't want to do a lot of work, buy the mining kit, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Now, if if you want to save some money, or if you don't want to dive that deep, you, like, I think, if I remember correctly, when I bought these, I paid something like $25 a piece. In the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot of money to spend $50, $60 on these devices. That being said, let's manage your expectations. You paid $60 on something that you, you're going to geo-mine with. Do you really think you're going to become a millionaire? Keep it in perspective. Keep it in scale, right? You're not going to become rich overnight because you spent 30 bucks on eBay, okay? Just be realistic about it for a second. I'm hoping to break even on these before I have to replace the battery. I'm not going to be upset if I don't. Right? There's other functions to me that's valuable beyond just making money. Anyways, putting it down. Um, so what happens is these, these devices handshake, and at some point they have these collection of bound witness transactions. Uh, but these are, these are really relatively dumb. Um, they don't have a GPS chip in them. They don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have 4G. Uh, they're, for all intents and purposes, unless you're using the XY Find It app, which I can't anymore because they're Sentinel X devices, um, they're essentially useless. Uh, it's just a little chunk of stuff taking up space. Uh, which was a little upsetting that Sentinel X doesn't work with XY Find It, but what am I in it for? Right? I could have kept one of each. But I, I updated them, and I don't think there's any going back. But I'm okay with it because I'm here to help this thing grow. Um, when you get to the bridge, then it will send its information into the bridge. The bridge will confirm that it's received the information, uh, and it will clear itself out to make room for more bound witness transactions. And I can, again, demonstrate that in a little bit. Uh, let's talk about a bound witness transaction. And this, the, this, uh, this topic's actually a little painful for me because... It was the thing that nothing ever really explained in a way that I could understand until I just kind of, one day I was reading posts and it just kind of clicked to me. It just kind of made sense. Um, I always wanted to know what is a bound witness. And I think that that's the yellow paper. If I remember correctly, the white paper is talking about the cryptographic security and the yellow paper is talking about... Uh, uh, the bound witness. And, and if I'm wrong, feel free to correct me. I'm probably wrong. Use the comments, use the chat box, use everything you can to tell me how wrong I am. The bound witness transaction kind of goes like this. This is Joe. Do, 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 do. Oh! Hey, hey, I see you over there. My name's Joe. What's your name? And you're like, I don't know, eight inches away from me. Oh, hey, Joe, I'm Steve, and I think you're like seven and a half inches away from me. Oh, Steve, great. Thanks, bye. That's a bound witness transaction. 
Uh, now, to get a little more technical than that, um, you have a send, a confirm send with a little bit more data, and then a close the loop. It's a three three piece transaction. Something presents itself, something responds, and then the presenter closes the loop. And in that process, each of those transactions gets cryptographically signed. I'm not going to go into the details. <laughs> Sorry, it just turned itself off. I'm not going to go into the details of how cryptographic signatures work. Please read the white papers, even if you want to Google or YouTube some other videos about um, cryptographic signature. SHA-256 is a common one to read. Um, hash keys, nonces, those are all buzzwords and keywords that will explain this better if you care, but you don't need to know any of it to make mining matter. What you do need to know to understand mining is bound witness is two things meeting, exchanging some data, and leaving. Now, that data packet, it turns out, and I'm, I'm learning this through experience of working with the iPad app, um, that data packet is a little bit different depending on the type of Sentinel you have. In the case of the XY4 Plus hardware, these devices send their name, also known as public key in the technical terms, and they send... Well, they kind of send, <laughs> they record what is referred to as an RSSI. Uh, and I don't know the exact meaning of RSSI. I, I did a lot of homework on it to try and figure out how to do it like manually. But essentially what RSSI is, is it's a reading of how strong the signal is that you're receiving. So, hey, Steve. Hey, Joe. Um... Hey, Joe, I just want to let you know I'm seeing you at an RSSI of 92, which is a really strong signal. 100 is the max, right? And, oh, well, that's interesting, Steve. I'm seeing you at an RSSI of 82. Okay, great. 82, 92. We both understand what our numbers were. Let's move on. Um, through RSSI and through the knowledge of the chipset that's sending the communication... Uh, there's a way to approximate distances. Uh, I believe the accuracy is within one meter. Um, and I say approximate because RSSI isn't perfect. If, if my hand is between the two, the RSSI is not going to be as strong because my hand is blocking some of those radio waves. Uh, there was another video that was posted on Reddit. Um, it was a YouTube video, but I, I found it on Reddit uh, about a week ago. I think I found it Thursday or Friday, um, where he was testing different containers to put around the Sentinels because they're really not waterproof. I said I would trust it, but it's really not waterproof. So he tried putting in like a plastic baggie and a metal bowl to see how the RSSI would drop uh, using a Bluetooth low energy reader on his phone. Um, it, it was interesting. I don't know how practical that particular video was, considering he was doing all the readings like right here, and I care about whether or not my device can reach the road, not necessarily two devices right here. Uh, but regardless, RSSI isn't a perfect measure, but it gives you a general idea of how close things were to each other. And I would say that like the most reliable answer is if I know where my keys are, and I don't know where this is. The fact that they've created a bound witness lets me know that this was within at least, at, 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 at the very most, I should say, at the most it came within 50 meters of my keys that I do know the location of. So I can go back now, talking kind of about the, the XY Find It app, right? This isn't in the app, but... If we wanted to recreate the XY Find It app with um, the new Sentinel X software, I could have one of these devices as a known location and record a timestamp of every time the other device came within 50 meters or a RSSI of 0, 01. Um, anytime they were close enough to create a bound witness, and I have those timestamps, right? So it's a way of finding location. Now... That being said, let's imagine a world where every person and every set of car keys and every rear bumper and every cell phone, let's, let's take cell phones out of the discussion for right now, but every person has two Sentinel devices 
all the time. Um, maybe it, maybe it's a chip implanted under your skin, just making things up, right? Um, that actually could be a practical use in the future, but I think there'd be a lot of privacy advocates fighting this. But let's pretend that every person has one of these guys under their skin, and my daughter goes missing. Well, okay, this is worth putting a query out there. So a uh, kidnapper wants a $10,000 ransom. I'll put $1,000 on the XY network to find out where she is, right? So here's a chance for you miners to make some money. But let's really think about this for a second. If there's a ton of these out there and there's no bridges, all bets are off. If there's no archivists, all bets are off. If there's no diviners, all bets are off. There's no way for me to get a query unless we have all four of those pieces in the process. So we need a diviner so that I can say, here's my $1,000 worth of XYO token. Go find this person with the public key of the device uh, being known. The diviners ask the archivists. They collect some data. The archivists are constantly getting information sent to them by bridges, and the bridges are constantly collecting. So let's let's put all those pieces in place. So we have we have the whole chain. We have my missing daughter who has a XY four plus XY uh, Sentinel X, one of these equivalents on her person at all times. Well, we now know every person that she's come within fifty meters of. Uh, that's great, but we don't have GPS data at this point. So at one point in the discussion process, and we've kind of moved away from this, at one point in the discussion process, we were referring to bound witnesses as selfies. So I wanted to prove that I was at a party. So I went to this party and every person I bumped into, I took a selfie and, you know, we've got all these pictures at the end of the night. You don't know what party I was at unless you know what party all those other people were at. And you also don't know if all the pictures were taken in front of black curtains and there was more than one party with black curtains. You don't know which one of those parties I was at, uh, you know, because people move throughout the day and night. So when these talk, they communicate RSSI, imagine distance from each other, and timestamp and name. They know each other, they know how far apart they were, they know when it happened. When we move on to the next level of devices, such as cell phones, potentially in the future, the coin app, not today. Um... But yes, now the XY network app, this can and does, um, this can and does send GPS as part of its package signature. Now, rest in that for a second, because XYO has been doing a lot of marketing around the fact that we could replace GPS, or that GPS is a faulty system that we can't uh, we can't rely on. In today's world, to get XY data to be truly valuable, you need something to be a absolute, right? Um, these are relative. These are, I saw Joe, I saw Steve, I saw Tom. These are absolute because of GPS. Now, in the future, I don't know if you've heard, there's an announcement that XY is launching a satellite. I don't know how the satellite's going to communicate with any of this stuff. That's, that's beyond my scope of understanding right now. I don't know what the plan is. Uh, but if that sent satellite is making bound witness transactions to... Uh, probably not these, but maybe cell phones or, or maybe their hardware, you know, Raspberry Pi style bridge kits. Uh, that's a way to force an absolute to a map. But today, just these has no idea where you are on the map. It just knows who you're hanging out with. Okay. Um, so to prove location, what ends up happening, all these devices bump into each other. We record all the bumps. We hit a bridge. 
All the bridges, to my knowledge right now, have GPS chips, so they GPS stamp that bundle that gets uploaded. That bundle that gets uploaded is then sent to an archivist that stores it, distributes it, so that there's multiple copies of every transaction, so that you know one computer doesn't go down and we lose you know, a tri-state area. Um, there's a lot of backup built in to the archivist system. Uh, and then, and then finally a diviner when it's needed. Uh, so what we want to get to is how it proves location. Okay. And I'm, I'm getting close to the end of my talk here, but there's still a lot to say. Uh, so I'm not trying to keep this long. I'm trying to be thorough and, and make it generally understandable by the average person. Hopefully I'm doing a good job of that. Um, and hopefully I'm not rambling too much. I know I'm a little repetitive, but I really, um, I really want to make this next part very clear because it's the piece, it's the piece of the puzzle that gets me both excited and concerned with the way that we are, well, I shouldn't say we, with the way that the XY company is handling some of their marketing processes right now. So, I've explained to the point collisions, bound witnesses, I've explained to the point bridges uploading to the network and, and archivists pushing that information and diviners being there. And now if we go all the way back to the beginning when I talked about geo mining versus geo drops, the coin app versus the XYO network, um, it comes down to data being useful. This is where it's my opinion now. I can't think of a, uh, of a practical application for myself um, or even my company who's in, in you know, product sales. Um, we, of course, have warehousing. We, of course, have a fleet of roughly 20 vehicles where I work. Um, we have five or six buildings. I can't think of many, I'm not going to say any, but I can't think of many applications where it is valuable for me to know that my keys are in my bag. Because if I know where my bag is, I've already looked there for my keys. Or let's take it a step further. We had a TV delivered off of a semi. And I need to know if that TV is next to the other TV. Or if that TV is close to the ladder. Even in those instances where it sounds like it yeah, it could be valuable to know, you know, let's think of a hospital situation, for example. Hospitals do this all the time. Um, they've got those blood pressure machine things on sticks that, like, you know, it's it's like an EKG, or it measures your heart rate and your pulse and your oxidation levels, and those are really expensive machines. So what they do is they put a, a Wi-Fi tracker on it, and there's some software that I thought I invented a while back, but Cisco came up with it years before me. Let's not get into that. But there's ways over Wi-Fi to triangulate the location of an object and put it on a map of your building. So in that respect, if you have one of these in every hospital room, you kind of know everything that's in the room if they all have tags. Now that said, we're paying $25 per room plus $25 per item you want tracked in the room. There's what... Four chairs, a hospital bed, and six instruments. So we're looking at an investment of $300 or so per room to track all the stuff you got to track. I don't know if that's practical or not. Not my business. Not uh, not uh, what I'm knowledgeable about. But to me, today, without a GPS, there aren't a lot of practical applications to the system. We're fixing that with the app potentially with the coin app in the future, and potentially with the bridge network built out of Raspberry Pis. Because what those devices will do is give you an absolute reference point. That being said, let's think about the idea of a shipping company. And, uh, you know, USPS, UPS, FedEx, DHL, there's, there's a bunch of them out there now. Um, they all have their systems for tracking. And the argument against, let's just, 
I'm going to pick on UPS because I have buddies that work there. And I'm not saying there's problems with UPS at all. I'm just using it as an example because I use them the most in my personal shipping. So in, in the world of UPS, you make a product, uh, you, you make a label. That label sticks to the side of the box. It has barcodes and QR codes that have a 1Z number in my case. It's always 1Z whenever I print one. Um, and then every time that package hits a checkpoint, it gets scanned. So a package, um, a shipping label has been created. Great. The website knows that number and you can search for that number and you can see that the shipping label has been created. Yep. Slap the label on the box. You hand it to the UPS guy. First thing he does, he grabs his scanner. He scans the barcode. He has you sign depending on the type of shipping you're doing. If it's overnight or insured or anything like that, maybe you need a signature, maybe not. But he scans the barcode and everything he takes, and now the website is updated that the package has been received by a um, carrier or a courier. Great. That guy drives his truck, and that package is on the truck until he gets to the depot, at which point everything that's on his truck gets dumped out of the truck, gets scanned on the way out of the truck, hits a conveyor belt in the building, might get hit a few times for internal tracking, we don't get to see all of that, but eventually it gets put on another truck, where it's scanned again, and great, it's on that truck, and then eventually that package gets to your buddy's house, it gets scanned again, and great, that package is at your buddy's house. Now, this all relies on the people scanning properly, which UPS does a great job, I have never, I, I well, I ship a lot of packages. I don't think I've ever had a missed scan. I've had items that, like, I had Amazon send me smart post that they got confused over who's supposed to scan it and who's not, because it goes from UPS to USPS and to DHL and back, and that gets confusing. But when you stick to the same shipping carrier, they're generally pretty good about doing their scans and finding the right barcodes. The problem with all of this is the human element and trusting that company. So if I just wanted to send you something, and hey, you know, UPS is expensive, I've got a buddy that's going to Michigan tomorrow, I'll just have him take it, right? Um, he doesn't have a tracking system, and he's not going to stop at depots to scan if he did have a tracking system. So if you want to follow up on where your stuff is, you're kind of hosed. You can call him and ask him, but the XY network can fix that among other problems. So, now that we have this idea of tracking and maybe losing the middleman and not being, you know, the, the core of all cryptocurrency, one of the big things is decentralizing and not needing a central agent to track things for you and to, you know, like Bitcoin. Oh, we don't want a bank. We just want to have our value and we don't need a bank to hold it because it's not a physical thing that someone can steal from us. Good idea. I like it. I, I would love to see it become a real thing. If the speculators would move aside, we could actually afford to use it as a currency. Right now, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum are both a little bit volatile for my tastes if I'm going to go buy a candy bar or soda with it. But we'll get there someday, I think. I, I, I have confidence that someday cryptocurrency will be very, very usable and not so risky. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about our mining strategy, and I think this is what more people are going to be interested in, and it is by far the most opinionated piece. A lot of what I've said is just fact, and if you want to find the sources and verify the stuff I've said, it's out there, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure there's not a lot that I said that people will disagree with me on up to this point. This is where I might be controversial and where people might not agree with me. If we go back to the idea of mining, geomining, and the thought that all of the money to be paid out comes from somebody offering, right? When I send something over UPS, I pay $45 to ship this box, and of that $45, $5 of it is tracking the package, right? There's, there's a cost to that computer process. And it's probably not $5, right? Because they're the economies of scale. It's super cheap to track a package with UPS. It just kind of comes with it now. Um, you have to take that into account, <laughs> right? I mean, 
let's think for a second. If, for the future, all tracking costs $25 a package, you're not going to see packages get tracked unless the stuff in the package is very valuable. Plus, in addition to the $25 token, uh, that person has to pay the gas or the, the XYO token to the miners to be tracking it. So let's just say the average package, again, and I'm, I think I'm being generous, let's just say the average package is a $5, um, it's a value of $5 to track. So um, I make a shipment, I put my five bucks out there, the diviner takes a dollar, the archivist takes a dollar, and then four dollars gets split up amongst uh, sentinels, or sorry, the bridge and the sentinels. Uh, and those are fake numbers. I have no idea what the actual ratios are going to be. You, as a sentinel, are collecting your value from the transaction, but only if you interact with someone that needed your data. So let's think about that for a second. Let's let's slow boat. We're 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 gonna get a Dodge Ram and a trailer, and we're gonna go to this museum in um, New York City. And we're going to pick up this dinosaur skeleton, and we're going to move it to a different museum that bought it in California. And we're, we're planning, because it's precious cargo, we're planning to make this a 10-day trip. I know, it's slow, but we've got to take care of our precious cargo. And we're going to use XY to track it. So maybe in this case, maybe they're spending a couple thousand dollars to track it. That's, that's perfectly viable, right? Well, the day we pick it up... The sender is there, the receiver's also there to make sure we packed it nicely. We put it in the truck, we put our tracking sentinel in the truck with it, and off the truck goes. And we're not too worried about it, we let them drive for two or three days. And, you know, we're at a point where every person has one of these, of course, because, you know, XY is going to be huge, it's the next big thing, everybody's going to have one on their keys, right? Um, so we've got... Let's just say, let's just say on, on the small end, we've got a hundred people, a hundred sentinels between the start of day one when it gets associated with the cargo and the end of day two when we're getting a little bit nervous and want to know where our package is. Okay. So there's a hundred interactions of things saying, Oh, yeah, I saw that guy. Oh, yeah, I saw that guy. Okay. So we go out to our diviner and we say, hey, diviner, where's my stuff? Here's some money. Go find it. Diviners go to archivists. Archivists go to bridges. And, and that's kind of always happening. Bridges and archivists are always sending things back and forth. I don't know if they get paid at the time that they submit to an archivist. Actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure they don't. So it's a little confusing to me how the payout happens and when it happens and how the values are derived and percentages. But what I do know is we're going to get the information from all of these hundreds of interactions. And the archivist is going to have a level of creative license to say, well, we want to know where it is right now. So let's not look at any data older than, say, four hours. So of the 48 hours... The, the first, you know, of the 48 hours, the first 44 hours worth of data is just gone, and they're never going to get paid, and they're not worth anything right now. Well, we'll look at that four hours worth of data, and then we'll go, all right, who can see it? Do you all concur? Are you all in the same area? But, but here's what's going to happen, and I wish I, could, I wish I could draw right now. Um, follow me for a second. This guy up here in the upper left corner, he says, oh yeah, I, I was about, you know, 10 yards away from him at 2 o'clock this morning. And this guy down here says, oh, I was about 20 yards away from him at 2 o'clock this morning. Well, then the network's going to say, hey, did this guy and this guy see each other around 2 o'clock? 
because he was 20 yards away and he was, you know, what did I say, 30 yards away, they should be close enough to have met also. And if they don't have a time stamp close enough together to tie them to, to prove that they were all together, well, then their data might not be worth anything. There might be more reliable information from other sources that would verify this location. Um, another example. This data, I've been with him 50 times in the last 10 hours. Maybe I'm on the same truck as him. Maybe the driver himself of the truck has one on his keys because everybody's got XY tokens right now. Well... Is that useful information? Is it tied to a GPS? Has it hit a bridge that, you know, is a known location to the GPS satellite, or not the GPS satellite, but the XY satellite? That's what we got to think about. And, and I heard this in early discussions, that they're building into the system disincentives for providing phony data, you know, spoofed GPS locations, or you know, saying you saw something that we can't prove that you saw, well, that's actually already handled in the in the bound witness. You, you have to have actually seen them. And again, white paper, that thing. But you, you want to be as honest as you can with your XY systems because the network is smart enough to understand that, hey, if you saw him and he saw him, you should have seen each other and you might not be legit. One of you might be lying and we're going to look for other people to compensate to prove that your information is valuable. So the way I understand it, the way the diviners are going to work, they're not only going to provide an answer, but they're going to provide a confidence percentage with their answer. And as the... As the requester of information, I think you can kind of put a sliding scale that a 100% answer is worth 100% of my, my bid and a 50% answer is only worth 10% of my bid. And it'll pay out accordingly um, based on that. So anyways, lots of speculation there. Don't hold me to all of it, but think about the way that works. Because now when we get into strategy, I'm actually going to, if I still have the tab open here, I want to look at this Reddit post from earlier today. Um, yes. Um, I'll try to link this in the comments when I'm done. Um, Glitched DBA had a very interesting post with a snail mail network idea. Here's my idea. Get a list of people that want to participate in a mailing a box of Sentinels to each other. Generate a mailing route for everybody that wants to participate. Put my Sentinel on a zip tie that's attached to my name or handle for identification, and then put the Sentinel, Sentinel in a small box that can safely hold the number of Sentinels in the Smail Mail network. Then we send the box to the next person on the list, enter a log entry on Google Docs to say that we got it, send it to the next person once they add theirs, and so on. We repeat all the way around where we just mail the box from person A to person B to person A to person B around the circle. Um, now, each stop along the way, ideally, um, each person would have a bridge in their house. And if you, you know, keep the Google desktop sheet or the Google Sheets, then you have a certain level of... Um, understanding the trust of people, like, you know, your tokens didn't disappear or get wiped or get reassigned. Um, and, and this actually, this was actually the catalyst that made me want to do this video today. Because I love the idea, but if everything works the way I think it does, I think there are some glaring issues with it. First off, let's say we have eight participants, uh, because you could do this. If you have a mining kit, you could, you could um, you know, give Sentinels to all your family and mail the box to them, and then they mail it to the next person, and then they mail it to the next person, then it comes back home to you and your bridge, and all the data gets uploaded. That's kind of useless information. Right? Because the bridge has the GPS address, and we know that between this date and this date, you met all these people, and that's nice. But the eight devices that you have in the box, unless you're paying to know where the eight devices are that you put in the same box, you're not getting any value out of it. Now, maybe, 
maybe you get lucky and somebody needs to know whether or not a device came within this circle within this time and you happen to interact. But I don't think there's a high percentage that you are going to find useful data that somebody is going to want to pay for. Okay, now let's take this idea, flip it upside down. What I think would be very interesting is if you had eight sentinels and you shipped a phone running the XY network, locked open in kiosk mode, and if you know your battery can survive from building A to building B and it's going to arrive overnight, that's compelling to me. Because now we have a phone in a box in a UPS truck making bound witnesses, instantly bridging it to every every transaction. I mean, I mean th think of the possibilities there, right? People are going to pay for data that is accurate, timely, and trustworthy. Those are the three things that are going to make a transaction worth paying for. Accurate, timely, trustworthy. Well, if they see you interacting with a lot of stuff, and all that stuff is also interacting with a lot of other stuff, that makes you trustworthy. If you're constantly sending updates to the network over 4G or a nightly Wi-Fi connection, that's going to make you look really good too, because your data is not getting old and not expiring before somebody starts to look for something. The other thing, shipping a phone, you're going to take a little bit of care of it. You're going to, you know, put it in a box. You're going to pay a little more for shipping. So the items that it's going to end up next to on the truck you could make an argument that it's more likely to be next to something valuable that somebody wants to pay to track rather than one of these that you put in a USPS overnight postage envelope, right? Envelope gets sorted separately than package. So these being shipped, I don't know that it's really going to do much for you because we know you've bumped into a bunch of people, but we don't know where you were when you made those bumps. Maybe you're useful as validating that somebody is legit, because you've interacted with a lot of people, but are you really helping us find anything shipping these? No, what I think, what I think is a far better strategy for using your mining kit, which I don't own and I don't plan to because I don't have the money to dump on it right now. It's not a lot of money, honestly. I, I actually asked a couple of partners uh, if they wanted to buy the kit and then I would do all the work. Um, what I think is going to be a much more valuable use of your mining kit is to make partnerships or make friends or find something useful for businesses to put one at their loading dock or put one in the sign where delivery trucks are supposed to come into the built into the parking lot or put one near a highway off-ramp where vehicles have to stop at a stop sign or a stoplight for an extended period of time, and there's a lot of freight traffic. I am speculating here. I do not see XYO ever, ever being a valuable consumer product. Please prove me wrong. Please prove me wrong. I don't ever see XYO Network being a valuable consumer product. And the reason I say that is Amazon gives me free shipping, and it's their fault to find the package that got lost. I can't even put this in the box before they send it to me. Do I want to prove that a return got to them? Then, yeah, maybe I'll put one in the box, but then I'm going to expect them to ship it back. I'm not going to pay $25 to send this to Amazon and then never see it again, right? It just doesn't make sense. So what I would do from a strategy with your mining kit, find busy intersections. Like I live, I don't know if you can hear the road traffic. I live on a pretty busy road in Green Bay. You can put this out there and any cars that drive past it, hopefully they're there long enough to make a bound witness transaction. Now remember, a bound witness is yes, yes, complete. Three conversations have to happen to get a bound witness to happen. So you need to be close enough for long enough for those three conversations to happen, and I don't know how long that takes. But if you put this on the street corner by the stop sign, you should, in theory, get a handshake from every vehicle that stops at that stop sign. That might be valuable if there's something in that vehicle. 
So let's increase our chances of it being valuable by making this a stop sign near an industrial park, near a highway, near uh, a retail hotbed, somewhere where there's something valuable and worth tracking. I'm not going to say it's not worth tracking a pet, right? So maybe you want to put these out at a dog park. You know, a lot of people wear these on dog collars and, and great. Now it's valuable data. Um, but you want to maximize your investment, you got to put yourself in a position to get the maximum amount of valuable data. And then it doesn't stop there, right? It doesn't stop there. So when we get to doing the bound witnesses and, and this thing's got 20, 30, 40 trucks that came by today, I don't know how much the memory is. Can I store 100 bound witnesses? Can I store 200 bound witnesses? How long does it take to make a bound witness? These are all questions I have that I don't have the answers to. Well, that's going to influence how often I need to bridge this device, right? This device sees this device. Boom. Bound witness. Great. This device sees a new device. Boom. Bound witness. This device sees this device again. Boom. Bound witness. I don't know. And I, I actually, I think, I think I do know that it's not the case that the third device is not known here at all, right? If this one is stationary and it meets 20, 30, 40, 50 new friends today, and now all of a sudden this guy drives by, boom, we've met, that's great. But unless this guy sees a bridge, the other 20 people are just gone. They've never existed in the closed network of these two devices, right? They don't communicate the other friends that they've seen unless you're a bridge. So my suggestion, my strategy for making money geomining is to get your sentinels in a position where they will see regular, heavy business traffic and that you can go to regularly with your phone. I honestly, I don't know. I, I, I haven't bought the, the mining kit. I know it's built on a Raspberry Pi. But I honestly don't understand the strategy, the idea of having the Raspberry Pi in a set location. Because even, even myself, let's say I took that Raspberry Pi and I installed it at the loading dock at work where we see, I don't know, a couple, couple hundred packages in and a couple dozen packages out every day. If I realistically did that, and if every one of those packages were tracked... Okay, now we're talking something. But not everybody has access to a loading dock uh, with regular freight. So let's say I put that in my home, right? And I've got my eight Sentinels that came with it. Um, me talking to my eight Sentinels and uploading that information, I'm never going to pay to see where my eight Sentinels are. It's not valuable to me. So those eight Sentinels are never going to make any money. Um unless I luck out and I happen to run into somebody else and then I happen to get home to my bridge soon enough for the data to still be worth something. You know, there's a lot of iffiness there, right? There's a lot of what am I really doing this for in that conversation? So my suggestion again, get your sentinels in high traffic areas and leave them there. By all means, travel with one. That's fine. But if we can reliably, if we can reliably look at the location of a sentinel and know that it's always in the same place, we can trust that sentinel a little bit more because every time it's reported in, it's reported from the same GPS location, right? Let's do an example. We've got this sentinel. Boom. Bound witness. The bound witness transaction at 12.05 says a GPS location. Phone goes away. This guy interacts with 20 people. Boom. Phone comes into the picture again. 12.08. You're at the same GPS location. This data just became really, really valuable. You have 20 interactions that are very likely, because within a three-minute time span, this guy hasn't moved. Those 20 interactions are all within 50 meters of the GPS location that this phone signed off during the bound witness transaction. Is this making sense? Am I, am I saying things that are helpful or, or do you guys just think I'm wrong?
I mean, that, that's completely possible because we are in opinion space right now. This is my interpretation right now. And, and it's it's the big gotcha, and, and I hate to use the term gotcha because they're not doing anything dishonest here, but it's this is important for people to understand before they decide to shove a ton of money into it. Again, XY is doing the best they can to market and get a crap ton of these things out in the public because without a bunch of them out there, it's not worth anything to anyone, right? You need these bound witness transactions to happen before the business is going to say it's worth paying to search bound witness transactions. That's just the reality of it. It's the chicken and egg problem I said at the very beginning. So, again, to boil it down, I know this is like the fourth time I've said it, my suggestion for the best strategy, put your tokens in predefined places that you can visit frequently or somebody can visit frequently, right? If your sentinel is getting hit by your bridge and offloading to your archivist, great. You get a better share of the pie. You're also not going to be used as often because we think you might be faking if you're taking so much control over the process, right? They're going to start to reduce the amount of your data that they use so that you aren't cheating the network, right? You still want to interact with other people. I even said that to somebody in a totally different thread uh, uh, several weeks ago. He's like, yep, I'm going to have my eight things in my pocket and I'm going to walk, walk, walk. And I'm like, that's dumb. Because you're just making the same bound witness transactions with the same eight dudes, and none of them are paying for the data. You're just wasting battery life making bound witnesses that nobody is ever going to find valuable. right? It's not like you're dropping breadcrumbs that will be there forever. You are creating a record of this guy was with me, and we were this far apart. And that data is only valuable for so long. I assume, and I have done no homework on this, but I assume in the archivist system, there's some way of calling the herd of data. There's going to be a point where we're just going to say, oh, you know, that was that was eight years ago. I don't know what the number is going to be, right? That was eight years ago. We're just going to forget about that information and auto-delete. I would completely expect that. Absolutely, completely expect that. Anyways. I hope that what I've talked about tonight is valuable information that you can put into action. I hope I'm not scaring anybody. My intent here is not to say that I don't believe in the XYO network. I absolutely do. I think this is a phenomenal project that I think could go... It could be the next big thing. I just don't like that we're saying it to everybody without a proper explanation. And that's what this video was intended to be. A little bit of a breakdown of my interpretation of how the network's actually going to work, how it's actually going to make money. Uh, let's put it this way. like in, in Forgetting about the network for a second, uh, we want to talk about, you know, let's just take the example of raising minimum wage. There's the argument that everybody deserves an to earn a living wage, which I agree with. And then there's the argument that you deserve to get paid more if you can do more, which I also agree with. Um, you know, if if you ask me, we raise the minimum wage, well, then the upper wages are going to want to get raised too, so there's just a little more skill. The point is, if you want a good paying job, what would Micro tell you? You can either do something that nobody else can do or that nobody else wants to do. That's what makes you money, Right? If this were an easy, autopilot, get-rich-quick scheme, the way that it's been advertised in some cases, everyone would do it, and the piece of the pie you get for yourself will get smaller. I want people in the network. I want this to succeed. I want it to go on. I'm only in 50 bucks. It's not a big deal if it doesn't work, right? Or I think it was 65 or something after shipping. Whatever. I haven't put a lot of time... Well, <laughs> I've put time. I haven't put a lot of money into the XYO network. But it could be huge. I don't even know all the possible things that you could do with this data and the DAP. It's phenomenally powerful. And once the right people pick it up and run with it, like the, the ride share, I think there was a... Um, I forgot the name, not Lime Bike, but there was a bike share bird maybe. Um, they're going to be putting devices in all their machines. Perfect. Put a bridge in every bike rack and put a, a sentinel in every 
device. You know, it went from this bridge to that bridge, and it made all these interactions in between. You got a good statistical guess at where all of their um, where all their bound witnesses happened, even though it's not precise. It's great. Anyways, I'm going to stop rambling. Again, I hope this was useful to you. Uh, if you have questions, by all means, you can send me comments. You can talk in the chat, which I probably won't follow up after tonight. Um, find me on Reddit, What's Your ENT. You can find me in the Discord channel, which I, I hope uh, they aren't upset that I spammed in there. Um, or if you want to talk to me in person, just let me know. We'll get in touch. Thanks so much for watching, and have a great night.